Welcome to the Unconditionally Worthy Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Adia Gooden, a licensed clinical psychologist who believes deeply that you are worthy unconditionally. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Unconditionally Worthy Podcast. I have a really great guest on today. Esther Boykin is a licensed marriage and family therapist, and we just have a really interesting conversation, a dynamic conversation about how we can tend to build up the outside of our lives while neglecting the inside of our lives, how we can avoid intimacy with even the people who are closest with us, how we can move through the messy middle of life with compassion. It's a really dynamic and interesting conversation, and I know that you're going to get so much out of it. So be sure to listen in, listen to the end, and we'd love to connect with you. So follow Esther on Instagram. It's linked in the show notes. She shares her IG at the end. Follow me at Dr. Adia Gooden and let us know. Send us a DM. Let us know what you think of the episode. Let's get into the show. I am really excited to welcome Esther Boykin onto the podcast today. Esther is a psychotherapist who wants to live in a world where everyone believes that therapy is not a dirty word. Whether in her role as CEO of Group Therapy Associates, a coach, consultant, author, or media expert, she works daily to make mental health accessible, innovative, and culturally relevant for all people. In 2004, with a Master of Science from Virginia Tech and a vision of making mental health widely accessible for all, Esther Boykin began her career as a marriage and family therapist. Through the division of her company called Therapy is Not a Dirty Word, Esther brings therapy ideas and therapists outside of the office and into modern culture through media, events, and retreats that focus on her relentless relentless mission to increase access and reduce stigma. Esther is also the author of two books and a sought-after relationship and mental health expert. She has worked with Verizon, Deluxe Media, Elevate, and many other leading corporations. Recently, she was named a top 21 relationship expert by Cosmopolitan Magazine. Esther appeared on NBC Today, NBC's Today Show, Bravo's Real Housewives of Potomac, HuffPost, Good Morning Washington, The Wall Street Journal, Covetour, and a myriad of other media outlets. I am thoroughly impressed and very grateful that you've chosen to spend this time being on the podcast. So welcome, Esther. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I'd love to start a conversation by having you tell me about your own self-worth journey. Oh, that's such a big question. Um, I always sort of struggle where to start, but I think that for me, one of the more recent kind of turning points really was um, probably about five or six years ago, just kind of really, it was the end of my marriage, coming to terms with kind of ending a chapter of my life and recognizing that part of what went wrong was my own struggle to make space for myself, Mm. to pay attention to my needs, to to do what I help, you know, dozens, hundreds of people do over the course of my career, which is find that balance between how we um, take care of others and take care of ourselves. And so for me, that was kind of a pivotal moment of recognizing, like, eat, despite what I knew, there was more work for me to do around prioritizing my own needs and wants and and growth. Mm, mm. I think that's something so many of the listeners are going to resonate with, right? Sort of doing it's like sort of building a life right and and you sort of talk about this in your TEDx talk you all should check out Esther's TEDx talk we'll shout it out at the end and maybe link in the show notes so you all can watch it but you know you talk about being someone who sort of had it all like you you know achieving highly getting advanced degrees getting married right like sort of building the life that everybody says that society says is going to make us happy right like this is the way this is what you do to make yourself worthy this is what you do to make yourself happy and i think you know so many of us do that in in various ways and in, in various different ways and then realize like oh that's not working <laughs> and it seems like for you one of the the sort of so- signals that it wasn't working was the divorce. And so I wonder kind of what that experience was like for you and how you sort of navigated through that transition and whether that helped you to connect more deeply to your self-worth or kind of what that 
what that looked like. You know, one of the really interesting things for me in that time period was there were other reasons why my marriage ended mm. and that that wasn't working that are, were very much about, you know, sort of the two of us and, and, and very different sort of values and, and, and visions of like what our life was, the trajectory we both wanted our lives to be on. Where I really got this crystal clear picture was in fact, after we made the decision and began to tell the people in our lives that we were separated mm. and realizing how many people reflected back. I mean, you know, I grew up in the eighties and so sort of the go-to like kind of picturesque black family was like the Cosby show and the number of friends and colleagues and people in my life who were like, no, you guys are like the Cosby's, mm. right? Like you had this, and really having to then sit with myself and go like, wait, these are people who are close to me, right? Like these are not mm. people who just kind of see me from a distance and have a story about my life. These are people who know me intimately. And as it turns out, maybe didn't know me so intimately, right? Mm. Like they had this image that did not match the experience I had been having for many, many, many years. Mm. And so that for me really kind of brought me to doing a different kind of work. You know, relationships fall apart all the time, but that was the, the sort of moment that crystallized for me, like beyond whatever happened between us, this was really a story or a moment for me to recognize like, there is a disconnect between the ways in which I allow people to see me mm. and the experiences I'm having. And I think when we think about self-worth, that is, that's pivotal, right? Like part of valuing ourselves is saying, I deserve to actually be seen for my true self. Mm -hmm. I deserve to have the kind of support and love and encouragement and, and challenging that comes when we allow people to sort of see us at our most vulnerable and, and allow people to have truly intimate connection to us. Mm, I think that's really powerful because a lot of us are used to presenting a really impressive mm -hmm. outside, right? We look good, right? All the hair's done, the nails done, the clothes are on point, right? Maybe you get the car, you got the job, you got, right? Like, looking good, everything's good on the outside. And then internally, we may really be struggling. And it may be hard to communicate that. We may not even know how to communicate. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling or, I'm, or yeah, things are, are good on the outside. And it's not awful on the inside, but it's not right. Like there's something missing or there's something off or I don't feel that joy and that happiness that I thought I would feel when I did all the things I was supposed to do to get to this place. And so I think that's really this, the point of reflection that you had of like, oh, there's some, there's some disconnect and I need to sort of mm -hmm. allow myself to have deeper intimacy with my friends, to maybe even connect with myself more deeply around what it is really that I want and need and and how do I show up in that? And how I, do I let other people know that? I think that's really important. And I think it's something that so many of us don't do. You know, I know that for me, it's, you know, it's, it's hard to be vulnerable, right? Like even as a therapist, even as somebody who coaches people, right? Like it's hard to sit and be like, I'm struggling or this doesn't feel good. Or, you know, what do you think? Or just let people see you the most raw, vulnerable parts of you. And I think when we do that, as you're, you're alluding to, that's when we sort of are affirmed for our worthiness because people are seeing us, not the shiny outside of us, but the messy middle, the inside and saying, I love you. I care for you. I'm here for you. And that's really what deeply affirms our worth. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's something that I, I say often in my work and, and, and said before, you know, before I even had my own sort of reckoning with it personally is, you know, oftentimes part of what's missing in our struggle to feel loved and, and to connect with our worthiness is that we're not allowing people to see all of us. Mm -hmm. And so as long as you know, consciously or unconsciously, that there's a piece of you that these people who say they love you and admire you and value you, that there's this piece that they don't know about, then it's sort of like, well, you you only 90% love me. You don't even know that you don't love me 100% right. because I'm, there's these pieces of me that are hiding. And it's not that everybody has to know every, you know, sort of deep, dark thought you have, but then 
but as you said, it's allowing people to see like sort of the messiness and the complexities and the uncertainty. I think for a lot of us, as, I think particularly as women who are ambitious and high achieving and doing all of these things and you know trying to be a good wife and a good mom and all of that, we spend so much time doing mm. things that somewhere in the mix, I don't even think it's about hiding. It's just we s- stop checking in. Mm. We don't slow down enough to be like, wait, how do I really feel? Mm-hmm. Right? And like the more you accomplish, the more you feel like people expect you to know, to mm. be clear, to be sure. Mm-hmm. And so then it becomes even harder to say, wait, hold on. Like now nah, I'm pausing, mm. I'm checking in. I'm not a hundred percent sure about how I feel or what's next. And I don't even know how to express that anymore because now over time we begin to as- feel as though people expect us to be mm-hmm. certain, to know. Mm. Mm. And so then we don't even attempt to articulate some of the uncertainty or the questioning. That is a very natural part of like our growth as human beings. Like we're always going through new phases of questioning who we are, what we want, what we need, Mm -hmm. what's next in our lives. Yeah. I mean, there's so much that you're saying here that I want to sort of draw out. One is sort of talked about this, like when you hold back that part, that like 10% or that piece, there's, I, you know, like what came to mind is sort of like relational imposter syndrome, which is like, if you really knew me, you wouldn't love me. Mm -hmm. And so because I believe that, because I don't believe that if you knew all of me, that you would love me, I feel sort of like an imposter. I feel like I'm sort of faking it. You know what I mean? Like, I'll let you see the good parts. I'll let you see the nice parts. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll I'll put in a touch of struggle here and there so you know I'm real, (laughs) right? Just a little curated struggle. Um, But like, if you really knew, I think you'd be gone. And so it's terrifying, right? And so then we don't allow people to love us or see us fully, right? They do not get the option. And I think that's part of the reason why when I'm working with people on self-worth stuff, it's I'm helping them, okay, how do you see yourself? How do you show up for yourself? How do you care for yourself? Because, and then how do you allow other people to care for you? Because doing like that's how how we can start because it is it is so common people are like yeah but this stuff in my closet locked you're never getting in there and then you know I can't be my full self I can't let my guard down all of that sort of creates you know distance in the relationship and I also love what you're saying about the certainty and I think particularly for black women at least in my experience is you know we're socialized around strength And often feel like we need to embody this role in our families, in our workplaces of confidence. We know what to do, right? Like we're often the savers, the fixers, right? The ones who have it together. And there's often very little room in there for, as you're saying, uncertainty, for, I don't know, Mm -hmm. for, I'm still trying to figure it out. And it can feel scary to allow yourself into that space and... We often need other people to help us and hold that space for us, right? That's one of the powers of therapy, right? Is that if we're always in the ones like the the strong friend or you're always in the role of knowing what to do and getting it done and having it together and handling it, then you probably have a lot of people around you who expect you to always be in that role and may struggle to offer you space for you not to know. And so therapy can be so powerful and coaching can be so powerful because it gives you the space to not know. And the coach or the therapist isn't going to freak out on you, right? They're not going to be like, well, well, how do you not know? You guys are supposed to know. They're going to be like, okay, this is normal. As you said, as they're like, this is a normal part of the human experience to not know. And this is healthy to let yourself live in this space for a while. Yeah. And, you know, so I do a lot of work with a lot of my clients are Black women in very sort of high powered positions, whatever that looks like in whatever industry. And so what I find I'm finding over the last several years is like, not only is there like the circle of people in your life who expect you to know, right, because they've become, we've all sort of adopted our roles, their role is to like not know and to need you Mm -hmm. and your role is to fix and save and nurture and caretake. But then 
you get to a certain place sometimes like career wise, and then your circle of friends are a bunch of women who are having the same experience as you. And so while they're not looking for you to fix their lives and fix, you know, and kind of take care of them because they are also taking care of a bunch of people, all of you are sort of like, wait, but we're all fixers. Mm. And so you get into this other dynamic of like, well, I can't tell them not because they're going to freak out, but because then they're going to try to fix, Mm. like they feel like, I'm now one more person that they have to take care of, that Mm. they are supposed to solve my problems. And so I really love, you know, talking about that idea of what does it look like to hold space? Mm -hmm. And I agree. I mean, therapy, I think is one of the most, I mean, I think it's one of the most important things we offer um, is, is the experience. We need to have practice just having the experience of what does it feel like? What does it look like when another person holds space for you to be unsure, to be messy, to fall apart, to, you know, whatever it is, right? To just exhale, to like literally just breathe. So that eventually you begin to model that in your life. Mm -hmm. So that we go back into like our communities and our circle of friends and family and begin to model as instead of being the fixer, instead of having all the answers, be learning what it feels like to say, wow, that sounds really hard. Mm. And I'm guessing that with some time, you'll be able to figure out what's the best solution for this for you, but I'm here to listen, right? And like, as therapists, we know how to do that. Uh That's what we do. Mm -hmm. (laughs) That's what we do at work. Mm -hmm. But learning how to then do that in your own life. And I think it's work as a therapist or as a coach, but then also teaching our clients how to begin to do that in their lives, right? Like you don't need to be a therapist to do that. You can start. And as you start to model it, it's amazing how other people in your life begin to go, oh, well, do you have capacity for me to talk to you about my problems? Mm -hmm. Like these are things that I think sometimes we like, if you hear a therapist say, or you see somebody on social media talking about it, you're like, I don't know anyone in my life who would do that. (laughs) But people in your life can learn how to Mm -hmm. do that. They just, they don't have the experience and neither do you. And so I really think, that's been one of the things that even in my own personal work has been around practicing, that. Mm-hmm. you know, really cultivating. And some of it was cultivating some new friendships with some new people that, you know, I sort of met in, in more healing spaces yeah. and that kind of stuff, but also recognizing that like friends I've had my whole life, they were just waiting for me to give them the opportunity mm-hmm. to do that. Mm-hmm. It's not that they didn't know how it's not that they didn't want to. It was like, Oh, but you, this is how you show up. You show up mm. like you've got it together. Mm. But now that you're letting me know, like, you don't always have it together. I, I can do this for you. I no. want to do this for you. I've been waiting for that mm. moment. And I think that that's an experience that a lot of us could have if we take that little bit of leap of faith mm. with some of the people in our lives. I love that you name it as a leap of faith because it really is, right? Like giving people the opportunity to show up for you. And that's a vulnerable place, right? It's vulnerable to say, hey, I need your help and then wait, right? Because then you're waiting and they may show up and they may not show up. And you may have had people in the past who didn't show up. Maybe the little one in you Mm -hmm. is like, we do not ask anybody to do anything for us because our heart was broken again and again by these adults in our life who didn't do what they are supposed to do for us. And so that's it. We do it for ourselves. Like maybe the little one in you is saying that. And so it's like, okay, how can the adult, the grown up in you say, we're going to try again. We're going to allow people to show up for us. And I think a dynamic that can be created is sort of resentment and a little bit of like victimhood. Nobody ever Mm -hmm. talked, asked me, nobody ever, you know, and it's like, and it's like, okay, that may be true. And if every time somebody asks you, well, how are you? You say, I'm good. And this is happening and this is happening. I'm great. I'm great. I'm great. Right. Then they're, you know, they don't know that inside you may be really struggling. And so it's like, yeah, sometimes, you know, and that you have the relational training as a marriage and family therapist. It's like, well, you know, the other people have a role. And then we also have a role in this. We we are also contributing to this dynamic. And if we create space for somebody else to step up and step in and help us, they are more likely to do that. Um, instead of just assuming they can't do it, they won't do it. And so we're not going to let them try. 
And I, I think that that really gets into some a place that I see sometimes people get really stuck is that insight is not enough, mm. right? Like sometimes we're able to, whether it's through therapy or coaching or you've read some books or whatever it is, and suddenly you're kind of like, oh, I can't, I don't ask for help because of these experiences in my childhood and a previous, really, you know, wherever it came from. And then they stop. It's like, no, no, no. The point of insight is so that we can gently challenge mm-hmm. ourselves to do something different, right? It's so that we don't get into a pattern of self-criticism, like, mm-hmm. oh, I don't trust anybody, or I have trust issues, or I don't know how to be intimate with you know other people or whatever, and go, oh, no, no, this totally makes sense. It makes sense that the little girl in me learned to do certain things because this was the dynamic. Mm-hmm. But I'm a grown up now, mm-hmm. which and that that pattern doesn't serve me. It's not getting me what I need. And now it's time to intentionally choose to do something different. And and so I try really hard in my work and, and just in talking with people around, like, how do we sort of combine these things? Right. Like we need to think about it. We have to sort of honor the emotional mm-hmm. experience that comes up really practice our self-compassion, Yep. but we have to also take action. We have to do something mm-hmm. different if we want to have something different in our lives. And I think that sometimes that's where, uh, you know, sometimes I see people and they're sort of stuck in this, like, I'm working on my mm. self-worth. I'm working on loving myself more. Okay. Well, what does that look like? Uh-huh. What, if, what are we doing though mm-hmm. every day? Right? Like, well, as soon as I love myself more, then <laughs> I'll ask for help. Right. <laughs> then I, you know, then I'll have a different dating experience or a different relationship. It's like, no, no, no. These, these things are all intertwined. We're doing it together, right? Like part of developing that sense of, of love and compassion and worthiness happens in real time. Mm-hmm. It requires us to be engaged in relationships. And for me, that's always, I mean, that's what drew me to marriage and family therapy, you know many, many moons ago when I was in grad school, but it's what I love most about having a relational focus to my work Mm -hmm. is relationships are literally like the most important thing as a human being, Mm -hmm. right? Like it motivates pretty much all of our behavior uh, to some degree or another. And it is, I think, a rich sort of learning environment. You know, a lot of times I'll tell people, I'm like, you know, you learn to have different relationships by you know, dating different people Mm -hmm. doing or, or not even necessarily dating other people, but just doing something different in the relationship you have. You have different friendships by showing up differently in friendship. You have to practice the skill if you want it to, to, to see it grow and flourish like anything else that we do in our lives. Yeah. I, yeah, I think I really appreciate that you highlight kind of the importance of actually doing the work, right? And not like <laughs> sitting on the sidelines and being like, oh, that looks so good. That's really interesting. And I like, you know, sort of because we're in a world of like consumption, right? Like consuming a lot of information on Instagram or TikTok or wherever and like listening to a lot of podcasts, right? Like, you know, so that's great, right? Like it's a really good start. And part of the reason that, you know, we encourage therapy, coaching, those sorts of things is because then there's some accountability. And some guidance, Mm -hmm. hopefully, around taking different actions. It's also what you said about like, love, if I just believe, you know, I'm worthy or I just love myself, then I'll start doing things different. And I really go from let's start doing these things and these things are going to communicate to you that you are worthy. And they will then like continue to work, right? Like, so you mentioned self-compassion. If you practice self-compassion, it will, you, that's, you're communicating to yourself that you are worthy, even when you're having a hard time, even when you make a mistake. And that communication is going to make you feel more worthy. And then it's going to be easier to do the self-compassion. And we sort of like keep going there, but it's through the actions and the practices versus like, maybe if I just like close my eyes really tight and say, I'm worthy. I'm worthy. I love myself. I love myself 50 times. Like (laughs) it'll work. And I think that's why people get frustrated because they're like, I say the affirmations and it's like, well, the affirmations are Mm -hmm. good, but they really don't do everything. (laughs) That's like a small piece of the whole puzzle and all of the, because you can affirm yourself, but if the next second you're criticizing yourself, beating yourself up, 
neglecting your, you know, self-care, all this stuff, like you're not going to feel worthy or you're not going to feel loved. Mm -hmm. So I love that you say that. And then I also like the sort of you're highlighting the learning that can happen in relationships, because I think, you know, people say like to say, oh, relationships take work. But then many people still hold a fantasy that relationships should be yeah. instantaneous, perfect, mm -hmm. or they shouldn't, or you shouldn't be in them. So that's kind of a thing. Like, how do you, how do people understand? I think people also don't understand what is the work of relationships, <laughs> right? Like people are like, communication yes. is key. P do you know what it means to communicate? Like to really like acknowledge mm -hmm. how you feel, communicate in that constructive way, listen, right? Like there's all these things that people sort of gloss over. Um, and then I also like it because too often we think of relationships as, you know, and I think especially for women, you're supposed to get married. And if you didn't get married, then that was a waste. And it wasted your time, right? And blech, you know, yeah. and it's like, but there's so much learning and there's so much growth and there's so much richness and also so much love that can happen in relationships, mm -hmm. romantic and otherwise, that don't have to lead to marriage or last forever. I, I think that is so key. And I so often watch people stay in relationships that are unhealthy, that no longer serve either partner, mm -hmm. that are detrimental to the children, because there's this idea of where we're just, even sometimes they're in therapy, right? Like, and it's like, we're just going to keep working at it, working at it, working at it, because otherwise it's a waste. And like, oh, let's, let's redefine why we're in this relationship. Mm -hmm. Are we in this relationship so that at 85, you can say you were married for 50 years mm -hmm. and I don't know, have a party? Are you in this <laughs> so that you can? <laughs> and I really, uh, lately in the last several years, a lot of times I will get clients to read um, Bell Hooks all about love. Yes. And I'm always like, oh, even so if you're good. not into the whole thing, I'm like, I just want you to read at the very beginning where she talks mm. about defining love. Mm. And so that I was like, we need a working definition mm. Right. Because a lot of times it's like, well, I'm in a relationship, so I want to find love. I want to be in love. Mm. We love each other. And I'm like, OK, but then what does that actually mean in a really tangible way? And I, I'm always a fan of her particular definition, which is really kind of a blend of some other Eric Fromm and some others. But it really is right, like this sort of commitment to the growth and mm. development of each other. Well, sometimes we grow and we develop. And then we're done, mm -hmm. right? Like we've reached the conclusion of the growth and development that we were going to be able to help each other do. And that learn, if you can get to that place and with a moderate amount of like pain and some honesty and some kindness and that relationship that feels incredibly successful to me, mm -hmm. just as much as a couple who is together for the next 60 years mm -hmm. doing the same thing with love, you know, with kindness, with affection, with mutual respect, with honesty, right? Like, can we do those things with each other? And then that might mean the only way for us to continue to sort of show mutual respect or kindness means that we actually need to not spend time together. Mm -hmm. And that's, an, that's still an okay place if you can reach that and try to preserve some level of that respect and kindness for one another and whatever other qualities you've decided. Like, if I love somebody, these are the things that I want us to, to show and exhibit between us. And so I, I love that you said that because I think it's, it's one of the ways that society gives us one message that can very easily undermine our sense of self-worth mm -hmm. because staying in a relationship, romantic or otherwise, that no longer serves you, that chips away mm -hmm. at your values, at your core self, is one of the ways that I see women in particular betray themselves mm -hmm. over and over and over mm -hmm. again. Mm -hmm. And rebuilding your self-worth from that place takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of self-forgiveness mm -hmm. on the other side of that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think that's so helpful because I think people often don't know how to end relationships well because it's like yeah. you either stay or it's so awful right or you turn the other person into a monster in your head or you cheat mm -hmm. 
or you know what I mean? Like, it's like people don't know how to just say, you know what? I think this is done. And so, or like, let's have a conversation about like what, you know, we started out so excited and mourn the sort of loss of that and process it and decide, do we want to keep going? Do we want to end? Like, can we wrestle with those things in a way that honors the relationships we had that honors each of us? Mm -hmm. Right. But instead, I think because people don't know how to do that, they blow up the relationship, right? They either make somebody into a monster, (laughs) they cheat, they do right. Like, and, and, and so then they're like, well, I have to divorce them because they're awful. And and then the divorce is acrimonious and it lasts for three years. Mm -hmm. And You know, it's like there actually is a way to amicably end a relationship, a marriage, and to say, I'm grateful for the time we had together. And we both realize that it's no longer serving us and it's no longer working. And if we keep going down this path, it's going to be harmful to both of us. So let's part ways Mm -hmm. with gratitude, with grace, all of that. Yeah. It's just one of those. Sometimes the analogy I use is like, if we think about it as sort of like, you know, one relationship ends and it's sort of, and then we want to be free to like write a new story, Mm. right? I always have this image of, actually both my kids did this. I don't know what their thing was when they were like really, really small, but there was like a period of time where it was like, I would read a book and I'd be like, okay, do I want to read another story? And the only way to be able to read the other story is they would throw the book like the book couldn't be in the bed. Like you got to like throw it away. <laughs> and now we can read a new one. It's like, actually, mm-hmm. we could just close this. We could put it back on the mm-hmm. shelf. We could put it the, over here <laughs> and read the next one. And I'm like, that's mm-hmm. kind of this like attitude that we as adults mm-hmm. bring into this. As I love the, it is this sense of like, you got to blow it up. You got to like delete it. And mm-hmm. I'm like, that, like your life is sort of like a, your life is like a really well curated collection of essays. Mm, mm, Every sand doesn't always get tied up at the end mm, of each one, but it does come to a conclusion. It feels complete. Mm, and then we start something new. Mm, and I think particularly around romantic relationships, but the same happens in friendships, um, family. Sometimes it's a little bit different. It's, it's more like a a novel you got to like figure out how to end one <laughs> chapter and start another one like this story sort of continues but I, I think that's one of the skills that um that honestly allows us again to like bring a lot of self-compassion and 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 love to ourselves of saying like I don't want to have to set fire to every good memory mm-hmm. to every lesson I learned to every beautiful thing that came out of this time I had with this person mm-hmm. in order to move on. Mm-hmm. I'd rather learn the skills and part of those skills are how do I grieve? How do I learn to be with my sadness, with my anger? Cause I think that's also the piece that comes up when we turn other people into villains is like, I don't know how to hold Mm. my anger, my betrayal, my sadness, my disappointment, the grief Mm -hmm. of the things that happened here that disappointed me or betrayed me while simultaneously holding the joy, the love, Mm. the, you know, connection, the passion, the whatever else was good about that relationship. And, and that's a very, um, it's a skill and it's a lifelong skill. Like mm-hmm. we can't always hold both of them at the same time. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> Sometimes you got to be like, I can't even think about all the ways that this used to be good because it's so awful right now, but you leave a little space, right? Mm-hmm. Don't rewrite your past. This right. person was the worst. Mm-hmm. The past is still true. And it's okay to be like, I'm, I am just not in a space to like revisit that right now. Yeah. I got to, I got to close this chapter, or this part of the, our story. And then eventually in a few months, in a few years, whatever it is, you will be able to sort of say like, oh, it wasn't all bad. Mm-hmm. It was never, I just think, you know, loving of another human being is never a waste of time. Mm, I love that. Loving another human being is never a waste of time. I really love that. And I think it's so important because when you turn them into a monster and then you rewrite your story as it's always awful, very quickly we can go to, I was such an idiot. 
how could I have possibly mm-hmm. got, and people often do that if they're in a painful situation now, it's how could I have gotten myself into this? And you start beating yourself up, which is really the opposite of what you need. What What's helpful, I'm glad you brought up self-compassion, is self-compassion, right? Self-compassion helps us hold all of this complexity and notice it in our body and offer ourselves encouragement and helps us, you know, to like make sense without beating ourselves up. Because then if you start beating yourself up and saying, how did I get here? Part of it is try, it's an attempt at an escape. Because if I could fix it in my mind, if I had never met this person, if I had never gone on that date, if I had never, right, then maybe I wouldn't be experiencing this pain now, right? And so we sort of like run away mentally and try to fix it. But meantime, we're beating ourselves up. How could you be so stupid? Why didn't you see that sign? Blah, 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 blah. You didn't notice that flag, right? And instead it's like, okay, there were so there were some things that drew you in because it was so exciting and it was so new and you felt loved and you felt this or that person felt like they saw you or got you in this way and maybe you did overlook some of these things because you were desperate for love or whatever it is right that's again mm-hmm. therapy can help you learn to hold all of this and through the through line is compassion 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 because it really is this sort of magic tool <laughs> that helps so much when you're dealing with the messy middle of life. Because I think the other thing we try to do with relationships is we make them black and white. It's all good or it's all bad. And the truth is it's messy and it's we're in the messy middle most of the time. And so if we can stay there, if we can get more comfortable with the uncertainty, with the complexity, with the mess then we're able to sort of show up to all the richness of life um, in a more helpful and sustainable way. Yeah, I, I mean, I really couldn't agree more. And as you're sort of talking, I was really thinking, you know, part of what happens when we rewrite, we rewrite the older person as the villain, and then we become the victim. And when we sort of cast ourselves as the victim in our own mm. story, we're not just a victim to that person and their, Mm. you know, bad choices and mean behavior. We become a victim to our own self-critic. And the truth is, and it is hard to have compassion for that because what we really need to be is sort of, I always say like, you're the hero of your story. Yes. Right. And there's a very clear sort of story structure uh, (laughs) from my therapist who like narrative therapy, right? Like, being the hero means you're going to struggle, mm. means you're going to have setbacks, means you're going to, you know, if we think about it almost like as archetypes, right, or like a mythology and like superhero movies, right? Like the villain really just represents some piece of you, mm. your experience, your mm-hmm. story, something that you're struggling with. And navigating your way through and out of that is really about kind of stepping more fully into like who you're you're meant to be in your own life story and so i think when we can even when you're struggling with beating yourself up and the self-criticism is kind of that reminder of like well hold on i am the leading Mm. i'm the mean character Mm. here this is my story my life so if i'm the main character not a lot of stories and movies that end with the main character just down and out (laughs) and despondent (laughs) right like wouldn't be fun to watch right (laughs) yeah like we're sort of waiting for like oh what's the lesson Mm -hmm. they're gonna learn what's the skill they're gonna claim what's the thing Mm. they're gonna discover about themselves that then carries them to whatever kind of is the next piece and can we see ourselves in that way can we kind of really own like, oh, I am writing my story. Mm. And so it is important to look back for context. But the truth is I need to be present to right now so that I can set myself up for whatever it is I'm hoping, you know, the next, the next phase looks like. Yeah. I love that you're sort of taking this hero's journey and really sort of up giving a frame so that people can apply it to their own lives, right? Like how can you be the hero in your journey? And, you know, as our time comes to a close, I'm wondering if, because I know you talk a lot about self-compassion, you talk about it in your TEDx talk. I wonder if you could Mm -hmm. share maybe your favorite self-compassion practice or your favorite way that you use self-compassion in your own life, or you advise clients to use it um, as a really good takeaway for everyone listening. So if they're like, okay, like I need to work on some of these things and I want to start to do the work and actually take action. What might you recommend? 
So I actually talk about this in my, I kind of lay it out in my TED talk is sort of three main things, right? Like how do we, self-kindness, mindful awareness, common humanity. And so in a more tangible, like what does that look like, even in my own life is the self-kindness um, and mindful awareness for me are, kind of go hand in hand. So it really is about saying like, even if it's just like two minutes a day where you just stop what you're doing, mm. no distractions, just a second to like notice your own breath and genuinely pause and ask yourself, I, the, I like to ask like, okay, how do I really feel? Mm. Like I, I practice what I preach. I sent, I don't think there's a single client of mine in all of the many years I've been doing this that I haven't been like, oh, we need a feelings chart. Mm. We're getting a poster. We're getting a list of feeling words, but really kind of saying like, okay, how, what's happening inside for me. Mm. And even as a therapist with a very large vocabulary of feeling words, even I struggle some mm-hmm. days of like, huh, I don't know what I'm feeling. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, we need to pause a little longer. What do I need? How can I be more gentle with myself? Like really kind of, and that's sort of that, the pause allows you the space, that mindfulness allows you the space to be a little kinder to yourself, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I, I always say like, imagine if, you know, a friend or even, you know, sometimes you're just out, right? Like you stop at a coffee shop and the person asks you and the way they ask you how you're doing makes you feel like they want an honest answer. Mm-hmm. That moment, regardless of whether you give them an honest answer, in that moment, there is a, a level of kindness and compassion that you feel, a, a sense of being seen as an actual human being in the world that mm. you can give to yourself. And so mm. like, that's how we want to ask the question. And then I think the other part, kind of going back to obviously my relational roots is just reminding yourself that you're not alone. Mm. I, I, I don't think that we pay enough attention to how often we feel lonely. Mm. And I don't care if you are married with eight kids that all live with you (laughs) or you live by yourself, (laughs) whatever your life looks like, whether you work from home, you work in a big office. Most of us have periods of time where we really feel lonely. I think a lot of people experience that in the last couple of years. And we really do need to be reminded that we are not by ourselves, that we, even when we don't feel immediately connected, we are in fact connected to human beings. Um, that just that sense of belonging Mm -hmm. also allows us to feel more compassionate for ourselves. Mm -hmm. That's great. That's wonderful. Well, Esther, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast, for sharing your wisdom with us. It was really helpful and insightful. And I know that people are going to want to connect with you further. So will you let people know where they can find you and how they can connect with you? Absolutely. So you can find me, you can find me basically everywhere, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. I will tell people I'm most active on Instagram. So if you would like me to respond to you, (laughs) like in a timely fashion, find me on Instagram and it's at Esther B M F T. So it's E S T H E R B for Boykin, M F T for marriage and family therapist. Um, And then I always like to tell people if you visit, so I, I do run a private practice and we also do therapy is not a dirty word. If you visit estherboykin.com, you'll find links to all of the, the, the companies, the services that I awesome. offer. So that's probably a good starting point. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, we thank appreciate you. your time, your energy, your wisdom. Oh, thank you so much. This has been lovely. I'm just really honored to have been on the show today. Thanks. Thanks.